Welcome back to Miki. It's time for like one of my favorite segments of the show. I know you don't like one of. You probably want the favorite segment that, of the show. That's what I want. But you know, it's just. But I'm not getting it. That's fluid <laughs> because that could change each week. But you know, right. pretty steadily, I look forward to this because we have a lot of fun. I come across these headlines. I don't know how to make sense of them. I okay. think they shouldn't be real. But no, they are real. And so we call this, no, this is real. And you're Eddie V when you sit across from me and we do this, right? right. Okay, because you kind of loosen up and help me make sense of this. Okay, so, Ed, I saw this headline and I thought, how, this is unbelievable. I've never even heard that this particular disease is still around. Okay. But a uh, seven-year-old little girl in Colorado uh, contracted the bubonic plague. Yeah. Okay, think back to the Middle Ages, right? right. And, 1300s. Uh, yes. So how is that possible? And so here was the deal. She had a fever of 107 degrees and a high heart rate and was having seizures. So her family took her to the emergency room and doctors rightly assessed that she had this disease. And so they were able to treat her and she's recovering well. But here's what I want to say to you. Yeah. You know, people make fun of us for being germ phobes. <laughs> yes, they do. Do you want to know how she contracted this? Okay, came in contact with a dead squirrel and they believe that fleas, because it's from flea bites, right, that right. this is spreading. Fleas bit her, came in contact with a dead squirrel, squirrel seven-year-old girl. Yeah, and, and, and my understanding is that uh, with these kinds of epidemics, there's, uh -huh. there's still a lot of, there are a lot of questions still on the part of pathologists yeah. who don't know how, for example, these kinds of things spread. But my understanding was, you know, there, the guess is that rats on ships during the Middle Ages yes. that went from, you know, city-state or city to city um, a actually spread this through the fleas. So these diseases a lot of times don't disappear. They even talk about the epidemic, the flu epidemic right. uh, of the early 1900s. Those kinds of things can still happen. And so sometimes we uh, kind of lower our guard. Right. And we think that, uh, you know, we had a, a, a segment uh, one time uh, about um, People do having these uh, th this kind of cleanser that was uh, yeah the, was the waterless no, shower waterless shower yes and we were talking about the fact that in a lot of countries even though in America we'd go that is gross you would want to kill as many uh, of these germs as possible because you never know when some kind of epidemic could be triggered but I will say in our defense yes because I am right on that uh, the, the hand sanitizer yeah. they make fun of me right uh, you know uh, in my department at the AFA journal <laughs> uh, we have the big huge dispensers but even that we're not safe because hand sanitizer does not kill viruses so I recommend a little of that. What's that spray you spray on every door? Lysol. Yes. Under the arms. I do a little of that behind the ears, <laughs> on the hands. But do you find this a little bit scary? You know, I was looking and I thought, you know, I don't engage in these practices. There's another story in the same article about a 59-year-old man uh, earlier this year who contracted uh, the same plague because he pulled a dead mouse from his cat's mouth. Yeah, you have to be really careful. I, and here's another thing. I read about a woman out west somewhere in, in this country who died of some disease. This is very gross. So if they're little children, you may want to hide them. Who uh, the, the woman did not wash off her Coke can and it had dried rat urine on it. And oh. uh, you're supposed to wash those off before you put them to your lips because they've been sitting in warehouses, rats running around. She died of some kind of weird disease. That kind of stuff doesn't scare me. I think you should... You have to trust God at some point, but I think that, as the Bible says, uh, cleanliness is next to godliness. That's not in the Bible, no, that's Ed. Not you in just the Bible. made that up. <laughs> but it should be. It should you be. know how many people think that's actually in the that's Bible? That's not in the Bible. I saw that, and I just thought, that's, I didn't know that that was still possible. Like you said, you know, you just kind of let your guard down. You think you're not going to die of, like, the black death. You know, you know? people in America are so have such a sense of self-sufficiency. Yeah. We don't need God. And you never know when these kind of things are out there. When the Bible talks about in the Old Testament, where God said, I'll bring a sword against a nation yeah. and the sword, you know, or pestilence. God can do anything. We ought to walk humbly before God because if he lifts his hand of protection, those kinds of diseases can come storming back, not just in this nation, uh, but uh, there's Around a good the Old Testament warning for you, even if you weren't looking for it. That's right. You know, man, you, that's a great point. We're going to move on to the next story, but that's a great point. We are so unaware of all the things the Lord protects us from. Right. We are so unaware. Right. Okay, so you ready for this? Here we okay. go. This story from Sri Lanka. The Sri Lankans <laughs> at it again. Sri Lanka. I was in Sri Lanka okay. uh, for a month one week. So each year they have um, an exhibit. It's called Facets Sri Lanka. And this year they it's had one. What? Facets. Facets. It's their largest okay. gym and jewelry fair. 
okay. where they have these exhibitors laying out their gems and their jewelry. And so here you have uh, one man at his booth, you know, an exhibitor, and he notices a man, a Sri Lankan man, acting suspiciously. And so he moves in to say, hey, listen, I don't know what you're thinking, but before you can get to him, the guy grabs his diamond, one of the diamonds off his table, swallows it. He uh. swallows it, okay? So here you go, 1.5 carats in Sri Lankan wow. rupees, $1.8 million, American uh, U.S. dollars currency, $13,000. So not a whole lot as compared to 1.8 million rupees. But here's the deal. They take him to the hospital. He's arrested. They take him to the hospital. They do an X-ray. And they say the diamond is, in fact, inside. They're holding him pending further investigation. <laughs> and pending something else, right. I imagine. Pending they get further... their hands on that evidence. What? <laughs> so here's my question. Because the story says that one of the doctors in the uh, hospital says we should cut him and take it out. We should retrieve the diamond. Is that necessary? To cut him to take the diamond? I would only say That's just if the diamond would hurt him in, one, let me just put it as delicately as possible, carats. in passing the evidence. <laughs> if bodily harm could occur, then you might want it. But no, I don't, I don't think he should cut him. I would have, he might have gotten away with it if he'd gone for the Happy Meal, maybe a smaller <laughs> diamond, a little bit smaller. You know, like kids' toys that they... Can you imagine, though? I mean, and they say pending further investigation. What do you think they mean by... I don't know. I mean, is that their nice way of saying we're just going to wait and see if this kind of all comes out in the wash or... Well, I guess if... prob probably when they meant by pending f further investigation. At, at some point early on in the investigation, it's he said, he said. He swallowed my diamond. No, I didn't. <laughs> So further investigation means they start with the x-ray. Right. Oh, you've got a diamond in you. Now, pending further investigation, we've got to make sure it's this guy's diamond. Right, he what... could be swallowing diamonds all <laughs> over Sri Lanka. <laughs> and you can't, you can't prove that it's his diamond. So he's got to identify it. So you know the next... I mean, because the guy could be further... like, no, I came to the exhibit with that diamond. Right. That's, that's, my, that's what I had for breakfast. You I know, had, you just never right. know what his There's defense is going to be. See? Okay, last story. And, you know, sometimes we have to make really tough decisions and... You know, hindsight is always 2020. I don't know what this Arizona woman uh, would have decided had she, you know, to do it all over again. But here's a story. Uh, Scorpion Sting mm. in Arizona sends yeah. this woman to the emergency room and her medical bill. You ready for this? Okay. Scorpion Sting, $83,000, Ed. $83,000. Now, here's wow. the good news. Her insurance has paid $57,000. Yeah, because mine, I have a Scorpion Sting rider. Yeah, do mine. you have that yeah, just in the event yeah, that you have something? So her portion is still $25,000. Here's the deal. The anti-venom treatment that she got, she had to have two of them, uh, $40,000 per dose. Wow. Well, I, I, I know that... Uh, I know that a lot of drugs are very, very expensive. I, I know that, for example, certain types of chemo and all that kind of stuff can run in the tens of thousands of dollars. I don't. A scorpion sting. Yeah. And she says the doctor offered it to her, but this is what she says. He didn't tell me how much it was going to cost. Do you think she would have said no? Had I, he told I, her? I don't know. I didn't know that scorpion stings in Arizona were life-threatening. Maybe she had some kind of an allergy, but that's that's astronomical. I know they go through a lot of a lot of trouble to get this, and you know the anti venom. Yeah. Uh, because you have to actually, I don't know if you milk a scorpion or whatever, but you have to somehow milk the uh, the venom, and from there you have the anti venom. So it's a pretty uh, involved process. I would say if it saved her life, yeah. it probably is worth it. But well, yeah. Um, that's that's astronomical. I would have hesitated. I, 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 oh, I would have too. If they would have said, Miki, we've got this for you. It's going to cost you $83,000. I'd have said, do Will I it save my life? <laughs> do if, I need if that I, leg? If, I, if I'm going to walk throughout the rest of my life with a limp, I can do that. But if it's going to save my life, maybe I'll take it. Absolutely. Eddie V, always such a pleasure to discuss and flesh out these headlines. Thank you so much for joining me today. You bet. I got to tell you what's got me all pinned up. And, Ed, don't go anywhere. Now, don't go anywhere because it has to do with food. Ah, uh, I'm there. Okay, it's time for me to tell you what's got me all pinned up this week. I'm really excited because it's food. So I found this, uh, obviously, on Pinterest as I was just kind of perusing about. The color and the look of this dish is what grabbed my eye. So I had to check it out and decided to make it. And it's actually pretty good. It comes from the website uh, Lady Behind the Curtain. So if you want to check it out, ladybehindthecurtain.com. I'm also going to put a link to this site on Miki.org. You can go there. Also, if I don't remember to tell you at the end of this little demonstration, if you go to Miki.org, I'll tell you how I made this confetti bean salad my own. Made a few changes. But today, 
for the sake of honoring LadyBehindTheCurtain.com, I'm going to make it exactly the way she tells you to make it. So here's what you need. You need one can of garbanzo beans. I'm going to put that in your bowl. This is so easy. You have to make sure that it's drained and rinsed, and I've taken the liberty of doing that for you ahead of time. One can of kidney beans. Look at how easy this is. One can of black beans. That all goes into your bowl. And if you're serving this, taking this to church, or just even making it for like friends and family, a glass bowl is going to be really, really pretty. You need a half a cup of freshly chopped cilantro. Love the flavor that cilantro gives stuff, especially in salsa. So you're going to put that in there. Then you need a half a cup of green bell peppers. That's going to go in right there. And then one jalapeno, and you're going to take the seeds out of it, and you're going to chop it as finely as you can. One jalapeno. If you want more spice, you can probably do two. Ten ounces of frozen corn, but you need to make sure that it's thawed before you put it into your salad. So this is already thawed. Ten ounces is about a cup and a fourth, if you're going to measure it that way. That goes in. Then you let that all set, and now you're going to make which would be like your dressing that goes on top, because after all, it's confetti bean salad. So you're going to take some balsamic vinegar, about a half a cup. Just going to measure that out. I'm always amazed at how the chefs just kind of can eyeball what a half a cup is but because I'm not a chef. Oh, and then you need a jar that has a secure lid. And so I'm using good old fashioned mason jar. Most people in the South have these and drink tea out of them. So there you go. You're going to put, put your balsamic vinaigrette in there. And then you need about a fourth of a cup of olive oil. That goes right in. Next up, a half teaspoon of sugar. And again, this is going to be at Miki.org, a link to the site, Lady Behind the Curtain. And then a teaspoon of chili powder goes right in. Secure your mason jar. This is so easy, and it tastes good. Shake it up. And probably the best part, you can eat one serving of this, which is like two-thirds of a cup, and it's only 179 calories. So you pour this all over the top, right? And then you're going to toss it. And watch how pretty it is. This is what really grabbed my attention. You know that the site, Pinterest, is really just like a board of images. Like you just see all sorts of images, and it's just whatever grabs your attention, and you like it or you repost it. And so I saw this, and I thought it was so pretty. Just imagine you put this out at a gathering or a church function, and that's it. Just toss it to coat, and you're done, right? So then the key to really having the best flavor is making it the night before and then letting it sit in the fridge so that all of those flavors really get to marry. And so I did that. And so Eddie V, come on up here. I want you to try this and tell me what you think. And then you want to serve it with a slotted spoon because you do have the vinaigrette in there, right? Oh, it's it does so look pretty. great. It's beautiful, isn't it? Like, imagine you put that in front of someone. Like, that's kind of going to replace, oh, you know, I thought I saw it through okay. everything. So, and so, <laughs> so you need spoons. I'm, we have. <laughs> I'm taking one for the team. Can I, can hey, I just. <laughs> no, you can, yeah, do that. There you go. I thought I thought through everything. I tried to think through everything up here, not thinking about what you would need. And so, anyway. This is Ooh, really good is stuff. Good. Isn't it good? You That's can good. really taste the cilantro. Wow, it really comes good. out in that, right? It's good stuff. It's crisp. It's healthy. Mm -hmm. Needs a little chocolate chip ice cream. But no. other than that, no, this is excellent. I love the brininess of the vinaigrette. It's really good. That's excellent. And you know what? Uh, this would be great during the summer. I know we're mm -hmm. kind of tailing out of the hot weather. Yeah. But this would be excellent. Um, with fish, chicken. Yeah, you can put anything. it next to anything. I really excellent. like this. So if you want to know... Can I use How a you can make spoon? this? You can. <laughs> I'll get you a bigger spoon. Make sure that you check out Miki.org to find out exactly how to make this recipe. I'll have a link to the site, Lady Behind the Curtain, and I'll also give you my behind-the-scenes tips how I made this one my own. We're back in just a few minutes, and we're going to be discussing fatherhood. Very important topic. Make sure you don't miss that. The thing that makes marriages work 
that I have seen over the years is that, first of all, you have to have some commitment. Our pastors really need to take a stronger stance when it comes to issues related to the family and not be afraid to offend someone. To offend someone. <laughs>